still no conversions. It's um, one of those things where you, you start a project or a new business or, or something, and in your head, it's the perfect thing. And yeah, there's no reason why p- people won't go ahead and buy. Um, that's not what I've had so far. Um, so it's now, what is it, like early December? Uh, yes, yeah, 7th of December, and many free trials are coming to an end. I'm trying to keep on top of them. And um, some of which, like, a lot of them have been two-week free trials. Some have been a month. And people have given me, like, reasons why they can't go ahead on a month one. So that that's fine. One person is from um, Egypt. So the econ- economy over there isn't uh, isn't good. So that's understandable. However, there's um, someone else who said, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I, I like the idea of it. I will go ahead when things calm down at work in sort of the new year or like February. And I was like, yep, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. That's sort of half a yes, but unless people actually part with their money, it's not a full yes. So we'll see. Um, I've had good feedback from people, but just no money transfer, basically. No one's... I've not had my zeros at one moment yet. Um, so that's... Um, tricky but part of me is also thinking right okay do i need to market it you know like with any business you need to get more people and you need to market it but i think it is like i think of it as like if you're trying to pour water into a leaky bucket you're wasting a lot of that water unless you fix the bucket so in theory i'm thinking instead of acquisition and focusing on that i'm trying to focus on retention so in like the lean startup i think there's a a sort of acronym called like the the pirate metrics which is like a a r r r or something and it's like um awareness acquisition so this is in order of what you should focus on like from an e-commerce or like sales perspective um acquisition um no so yeah attention acquisition retention revenue and referral so you get two a's that start and then r's and then one is like retention revenue and referral so the point is that if you start on referral or start on revenue, then quite often it's not going to work like that. You need to sort of go in order of it to to, to be the most efficient, I think. And that's what I'm trying to focus on. I'm trying to, the acquisition, I can sort of, or the awareness, I'm posting on Facebook groups, getting people to fill in a survey for a, expecting to have a free trial of this new method that I've come up with, which is true. But I'm not given a time period as to how free it is. So I say two weeks, which is, you know, better than nothing, isn't it? So that's the idea. At this point, though, in every sort of startup or business that I've done in the past, I always, after, I like to go fast to market it and to build something official like a website because all you need really is to get the domain name, the URL from like what I own us or GoDaddy or something. And then you, you choose a platform. So, um, Maybe maybe Wix or WordPress or um, or uh, Squarespace, and then you can do a drag and drop build. You can make it look really flashy and really nice, and then put it live and think, right, I now own this. This is cool. This is a thing now, and you can showcase your product or service with this website, and it looks really cool. And then following from that, you can make a YouTube channel or Instagram or Facebook and create stuff, and that's really cool. However, it depends on what stage you're at. In every startup that I've done so far, I've started with that. So when Lingo is, when this thing was, or it was called Lingo Online in 2017, I think, when I started it, and it was a video calling app, um, I started and actually paid a social media marketing company, a very good company, to do the social media marketing, so like make the images and stuff for Instagram and post different things. But I now know that was the wrong way around. I didn't have any customers. I didn't have any people I was testing it on. So I didn't know if the actual product worked, yet I was marketing it at that point. So learning from that, the best way to do it is go backwards. Start with nothing, no branding, no nothing. I'm just me, that's it. And then work that way and see if what I have, me or this process, is valuable to customers or to test customers basically and these customers most likely will be early adopters which in in a broad sense means they're the first people to try out things they're the people who queue outside apple or iphone or apple stores when there's a new release coming out they're quite keen to get to be to try something out they're open-minded as well so that's the point so these people have um who i'm sort of bringing on board to trial to trial it i'm covering the cost of their sessions with the native native teachers i'm covering two of them for a lot of people some people have covered four um i'm not tested out on one session yet but so that's the idea um so these people the idea is 
without going straight to marketing and, and trying to attract everyone, I have a small user panel of maybe, I don't know, uh, up to 30 people who have been trying at once to um, to convert. And obviously some people's free trials have ended and I have a chat with them. So the chat's been very useful. They find um, the session is really practical and it fills in a gap of what they're what they they uh, they're missing basically. Um, most people are already using some sort of app or method to learn a different language, and these people are my target market. Because if they weren't already, then it's highly likely that they would give up while doing this process. They're not the right person for it. So if someone's not already trying to learn a different language and they're struggling, then it's likely that they'll put it off and they won't convert in the first place. Because um, it, it's it's like trying to convince someone to buy this fitness thing this item or this thing that helps you with home fitness or something and you say okay how often do you go to the gym and they're like oh i'm not no i might do it next year don't go for them because they're they don't want to solve their problem enough to be doing it already whereas language learners obviously using apps and things like that already duolingo or memorize or youtube and all these different things especially if they're paying for it, if they're paying for language lessons or they've paid for a course in the past, like a couple of hundred pounds, they are perfect because if they've shown an interest in what I'm doing and what I'm offering and they've paid for stuff in the past, it means they care enough about it to value it enough to part with their money, basically. Um, so yeah, obviously it depends. Some people are really good at learning languages and doing things without even having to pay for it if, if that's how they learn. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's my target market. And what I'm trying to say is I have a massive temptation right now to uh, make a website for it. I already have a draft of the website from when I started this in July, this sort of the concept of what I was doing in July. And I've put it on pause because I'm like, right, until I think that I need to get my zero to one moment, which means a paying customer. I think I need to have one paying customer at least to be able to prove, look, it works. Otherwise, I could be marketing it and it's a leaky bucket, it'd be inefficient, because if I if I don't know if it converts into a business, then there's no point marketing the thing, because there's, you know, there's no value. So I need to make sure that people are willing really like it enough to um, part with their money first. In other news, what I'm also trying to do is, as part of this, sort of, so I'm focusing on retention right now, so that acquisition I can sort of do via Facebook on a small scale. It's not It's not scalable yet in the sense that I can't put one pound in and expect to get two pound or three pound as a return. It's not like that. It's not like a, um, a scalable thing. It's I post on the Facebook group with a link to a survey. People fill in the survey and then I have a chat with them one by one. However, what I'm trying to do is make it more efficient to uh, to keep retention high. So by that, I mean ev- for every student who joins the uh, the platform, the um, website that I've made um, on Bubble, I want them to stick around and I want it to be useful for them. So I think that there's different touch points. Basically, so in a UX UX perspective, we think of it as um, a customer journey. So what journey do they go on and what do they see from the business and from different people and how often? So they might get an email, for example, or if you buy something, clothing online, you, you go on the website, you have a look around, you add, add to basket, then you purchase and you get a confirmation email. And then it might include a tracking number where you can track it and see the item arrives at your house and then um, after that you might get an email from the same company saying please rate it what did you think, think of the item and you can rate it or not that's that um journey but for this i think it needs more touch points because the purpose of the uniqueness of lingoers as i'm calling it so far in my mind is number one it's tailored content to what your needs are so tailored content to your language goals i want to learn language so that i can talk to people in a pub or in a cafe and chat with people. Right, let's give you that content then. Do you need to know about animals or numbers? Not really, maybe numbers 1 to 10, as in to talk about the past, maybe five years ago I did this or X, Y, Z, but not much more than that. So only focus on the tailored content that a student needs. Second USP is you get to practice conversational skills. So that's something that Duolingo and a lot of language apps don't do because for that, I believe you need a human, and that's what people have been telling me too. So the speaking side of it, they don't know if the accent's good, they don't know how understandable they can be to native speakers. So I want to show them, look, you don't have to be perfect to be be understood by a native speaker. Don't worry about your grammar, just have fun, enjoy making mistakes, and get a little bit better as you go along. They're the USPs, so I want to test if um, if they resonate basically. 
one thing that I'm finding that I'm finding it a bit not boring, just I'm putting off is the market research. I have done some, and I've done, done like a chart or like a um, yeah a chart of like um, these are competitors like language apps, language schools, these different things. What's good about them? What's bad about them? And different areas. So one area is like uh, flexibility. Um, so language schools tend to have a set date and time. However, um, language schools benefit because you can have conversation practice with the with the, with the teacher basically, which is really good. And so some bits from Lingoers match up with them, and some bits don't. For example, the pricing of Lingoers can be cheaper than a language school, but it depends. Um, first of all, how what package you choose, and how often you do it as well, and what type of course you pick from a language school. So there's a lot of variables, but there's pros and cons to everything, and I guess it depends on the person, on the student looking for the solution that they want to learn a different language as to what's right for them. But I guess my point is I need to do some more market research to, to make sure that, okay, this solution doesn't exist anywhere else. I don't think it does. I think there are really good um, alternatives. There's online courses, which you can do. But from my experience doing online courses, you sign up, you pay for it. It might be like 80 quid or something, so... But that gives you lifetime access to all the content. You would then imagine that because you've got access to all that content, you'll be fluent in no time. But that's quite often not the case because we need motivation. I could study that bit, but I've got to take the dog for a walk or I'm going to the gym. Or I'm doing something something else. So it's not a part of your routine quite often unless you have a lot of discipline for it. But um, a lot of people struggle because, you know, we're human. So that's that bit of it. But... My point is, despite the fact that there's a lot of content and you can pay for this content, you can even get it free from YouTube or watch like an Italian or Spanish or a different language TV series on Netflix, which I've discovered recently. But it's not like regimented. It's, it's sort of It feels like it should be fun, but sometimes it takes mental effort to do it and you have to be in the right mood. So just because you have access to online courses doesn't mean that you'll be fluent or... Um, or even conversational, because conversations take, when you're speaking to a different human, it takes um, a certain mindset, you have to, you can't anticipate what they're going to say really, you you sort of have to um, invent what you want to say in the spur of the moment and be um, sort of reactive to it, but my point is, I keep on putting off doing market research because um, it it can be boring and tedious, but uh, then again, I do need to, so, um, but yeah, I suppose being aware of what what we're good at and what we're bad at is really useful because obviously if you've got a bigger team, if I have a bigger team, I can say, right, I'm not going to do this. Someone else can do the admin or this side of it. I'll do what I enjoy and what I'm good at. So and quite often what you enjoy and what you're good at can be the same thing because if you enjoy it, you do it often. And then because of that, you're good at it. So yeah. So what's been my main struggle this week? Um, well, on one occasion, I um, I forgot to send an email, a confirmation email, to um, a student who's on a free trial, the second session of a two-week free trial. Um, the teacher was available and was ready. It was like half five or something yesterday. The teacher was ready, and I thought I'd sent the email. In fact, what I'd done is I'd marked on my to-do list to send an email to this person, but it was the wrong person, and it was for a session next week instead. And I marked it off as done on my phone. Um, and what happened was the time came it was half past and I sent an email to uh, the teacher uh, Giuseppe and I was like look uh, if hopefully this should work without me needing to be on as a host because we're using Zoom basically and sometimes in the past they've been sat waiting to go on and it needs me to log on to do it that's good for now but when there's 40 or 50 students that's not really scalable because you know it's, it is too many to, to look after there um, so in this sense, I was I'm using Zoom and I'm trying to figure out ways to make it more automated, so that I don't have to set up the Zoom call each time. Because at the moment, that's my weakness: uh, staying on top of things. Admin, basically. Um, I do use a checklist, but sometimes, you know, human error. I mark it as done, but it was the wrong person. It was the right person, but not at the right time, basically. Um, so yes, there's an issue, and f- f- because of that. Basically, at half past, as the student was supposed to be joining, they had no link and neither did the teacher. So I joined anyway, had a chat with the teacher, that was cool. But um, but yeah, the student didn't turn up because they didn't have the link simply. And then later on, they tra- tried to join and they couldn't. And I had to apologise for that. So that's an issue. So I'm trying to make it so that... Because at the moment, um, we're using Canonly to schedule um, t- 
time slots with the with the teacher, and then they forward me that Canada link. So to say, oh, this person Dave Smith has booked a call with you next Saturday at two p.m. And I'm like, okay, cool. I go onto Zoom. I create a new scheduled meeting for Saturday at two p.m. And I send it to the student. And then I also send an email with it saying, hi, student. Uh, just confirm you've got this session. What to expect in the session? You'll be doing this scenario, X Y Z. And I just use the same template on my emails. And then I just change it to the right time and date, and then I send it. That's what I'm having to do for every single session at the moment. But I'm trying to make that automated because as there's more people who join, that I'll, I'll be I'll be messy with it. I'll miss out stuff. And um, yeah, so um, I'm trying to automate it as much as I can. And I'm trying to find a way of making it so that within Bubble, so the the website that I'm making, the web application, I'm trying to make it so that the teacher or someone when when they can like create a Zoom call from their dashboard that I've made for them and then it sends out all the automated emails and from that point if I know that for that user they have a, a call coming up on this date I can then send automated emails probably plug in MailChimp into Bubble to have like a mail client and then that can send automated templates and change the names and times according to the data from Bubble so that's what I'm trying to do but uh, it's, it's taking time because I'm trying to because re- when I try to plug Zoom in there's a, a plugin, but then there's also like an API, which is like a, a connector um, between different things, and it's quite technical. And I didn't understand how that works. So, my first point of call is have a thing about it, like leave it, try and see if my subconscious can work it out, come back to it in a few days. But that's still not working. So, I'm looking for alternatives possibly. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, what I could do is pay for a more premium version of Zoom. I already have Zoom Premium, it's like £14 a month, but I could buy another licence, which is for the other the teachers, and they can link Zoom with Calendly, I think. So I might consider doing that, because then whenever someone books a call, uh, whenever someone books a slot on Calendly, it will set the Zoom up automatically. That's what I could do. So, But we'll see. But yeah, I just want to make as many touch points for the customer as possible, so that whenever there's reminders, because at the moment I can't get... And push notifications working on the web app. I can't. It, it doesn't work at the moment. And I've been quoted silly amounts of money from freelancers on Upwork. Like I've been quoted like five hundred pounds just to get it working. And the principle is, don't pay for something unless you absolutely have to, or unless it provides enough value to to be visible to get you return on investment. And something like that isn't worth it. But with Zoom at the moment, I'm paying fourteen pounds a month for Zoom because it can record calls and if I'm not there on a call between a student and a teacher I can watch it back and see the student's response and yeah and basically I can um, get qualitative insight and think oh if there's silences there or has there been enough time you can get a lot of information from watching something back and that's really really useful and also because I'm recording the calls I could possibly um, take them and put the audio on the student's account so they can listen to them back in the future, maybe on like a more premium service. And um, I'd like that to be automated so that you Zoom, the audio can be uploaded on, onto Bubble, onto their session, but I've not figured out how to do that yet. So, and it would take too much manual time of mine to do it, um, especially if there's more students. So we'll see. But yeah. I'm also experimenting with the pricing and the business model at the moment because for... There's going to be different models based on if it's an individual language learner or a language school. Like obviously, um, language school, I would set. I think I think my proposal is to do it based on per student, so maybe like a tenner per student or something. But I'm not figured out how to make it valuable enough for language schools yet. Their value is what they care about is student student satisfaction. So if I can make or prove to them that the individual language learners that I've been testing it on are satisfied with it then that could be their students. They could really like that and benefit from it. So we'll see. But um, for individual independent language learners, I need to work out what business model to use. So far, um, I have been proposing uh, courses. So one month course, a three month month course and a six month course. The idea is that the longer they stick with with me for, so the three months and six months are discounted. Um, However, um, I'm also tempted to go for freemium, so people can still access it for free, but then they have to pay per per practice session. 
um, and then I'd have to make the profit on that. So it's all about making it affordable but making profit. So we'll see. But um, hardest bit so far is being on the final call, the feedback call with them, and getting feedback on the pricing because that is quite quite tricky, quite hard to have a conversation with someone like that. But um, what I might do is just say, look, these are the plans that I can offer you. There's courses, and then there's the freemium where you pay per session, or there's this different options and say look without the pricing there how would you prefer to pay for these would you prefer to pay say 45 pounds or something for a month course up front and have that course or would you rather pay like x amount per 15 minutes practice session and just book a practice session whenever you feel like it basically with access to the phrases and everything so and um so i need to think what's be- what what would students prefer and also what's best for the business as well. Because if it's ad hoc sessions, that's less predictability. Less, less, it it stops me from being able to predict the revenue from a business compared to if it's like a month or a more regular, like maybe a monthly subscription rather than the course. That's easy to predict the revenue for. So, But yeah, it, so I suppose the question is, would, would I prefer it to be more regular revenue or more predictable? Or would I rather... Like, um, be more valuable for the students in that flexibility. I think the students value. I think making it more valuable for the students is better because, you know, it could be practical for me. But if I've got one customer versus a lot more students who are just doing it ad hoc, which is going to bring in the most revenue? That's the question. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to think about. But yeah, that's my. Um, that's what I'm trying to work out so far. So, but I'm trying to work out how to get feedback from people. That's why I need enough people coming in and flowing. Like there's new free trialists and then there's people who are ending the free trial and I just need to stay on top of it. And that's quite difficult so far. I have a, a Google Sheets document, but it's hard to update whenever they, whenever there's, there's a change because it's like you have to be on top of it. But I'm, I'm getting there gradually. On another note, I am, um, I'm yet to send an email to all language schools who have shown an interest. That's, what, that's on my to-do list. Basically, what I want to do is keep them warm so that they know, look, I'm still working on this. I know that what matters to you is student satisfaction. So I'm going to make sure that my students, independent students, are satisfied first and then see how I can tailor it to your language school. That's the idea. Um, I want to keep them warm and basically say, look, I've not found a way that this can solve all your problems yet because, to be be fair, it, it doesn't. I know that it doesn't because I've only just about made and oh yeah I've, I've released the student dashboard the teacher dashboard to the two teachers who seem to like it so far it gives them the information they need but it's very early days it doesn't track anything it just tells them about each each student and uh, they can now give the student feedback via this dashboard and the students can see it on their account so that's quite cool I think rather than having to use e- emails sent to me then I forward it to the student it's using one channel instead so that's good um but yeah, so that that's what I still need to do because I do believe that based on what language schools are doing so far, and there's a lot of schools who are open-minded to change um, as long as it basically it makes their students more satisfied and then because of that, they return in the future because they like it. That's what they want. So um, if I can help them in any way with that, then that's perfect. At this point, I'm thinking, my, my internal voice is, I can't be valuable to language schools right now. There's no point in me even speaking to them about it. So let's leave it until I've got it sorted out and, and until independent students like it, then I can show them something that I believe in. However, there could be an argument that if I demonstrate what I've done for students so far and they're liking it and I know there's positive feedback because I believe in that so far, if I even share a bit of what I've got so far for students, they might even like that to my surprise so whilst I don't think it's valuable for them at the moment they might be keen and it might keep them excited and motivated so there is that sort of um, potential so I'll send them an email letting them know that and I might at the end of the email say oh by the way feel free to let me know if you'd like a preview of what I'm building for um, for students so far so I could do that I suppose uh, the downside is that if they don't like it and they think it's a bit rubbish then I've sort of stained my, um, I've stained my reputation because they think, oh well, that that James is, you know, I don't, I don't want to work with him because it's crap what he's working on, sort of thing. So that's a risk. Um, it always is, isn't it? Isn't it? I suppose approaching someone and say, look, this is what I've got. What do you think? And it, it could be that they hate it, and then that means in the future, if I say, oh, I've updated it. Do you want to see? They'll be like, ah, oh, no, it's alright. 
I don't think it can be good based on what I've seen so far. So that is a risk. But um, I guess if there's a wide range of language schools, I think I've got about eight or ten who showed an interest. I could share it with them. Um, and if they'd like to see it, then I'm not forcing it upon them. I'm just letting them know. So, yeah, we'll see. But yeah. So that's uh, that's this week. And it's one of those things where I feel like it's been productive. But then there's also a million things I could have done extra that I haven't done yet that's on my to-do list. But it's funny because with a startup or business, there's no like, unless you've got clients who need something done by a certain date, there's no set time frames. Like I could just stop this for a week or two weeks or something and not do anything. And students might work out where, might wonder where I've gone, but I could just come back to it and say, hi guys, yeah, so I just took a break. How I and jump back into it. So there's no, there's no rush basically. And... I think that consistency is very, very important when it comes to this because you can do so many experiments and you can just continue doing new experiments and learn from them and gradually get better and better and better over time. That could take a year, it could take three years. A lot of people think that intensity is what wins, but I don't think that's right because you need time to test something. So I'm giving people two-week free trials. If I try and do it all in two weeks, for example, I still need to wait for that free trial to finish. So, And I also need to... And bring on more students so uh, my point is I guess I might feel like I've been unproductive or not as produ- productive as I could have been but it's not about that it's about being consistent and not giving up after one month or three months or something unless you've got data to tell you there's there's no chance but so far people are giving me positive feedback giving the teachers positive feedback and it seems like it's going in the right direction so um, so yeah, we'll see what happens. I still have a lot of ideas, lots of tests in terms of business models, content, email templates and video content to use within the app as well to teach people or to share information with people. Because so I think educating people as well is really useful. People who are like new to a different language and don't know where to start, having videos to tell them, oh look, you do this, do that, do that. And that's, that's really useful too. So there's a lot of stuff that I could be doing, but there's no rush. Um, I guess the more stuff I do, I'm, I can maybe speed up the process. The like, I can speed up the amount of time it takes me to get the revenue or to get to a success at some point. I guess, but um, I'd rather take the time and do it properly like this than try and rush into it. But yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, this uh, so today is um, Thursday because I'm I'm off. Um, I'm away this weekend, so I thought I'd do the podcast now. But I'll probably publish it maybe in a day or so we'll see um but anyway yeah so i'll see what happens next week i'm continuing to push on with onboarding new new students which i have done i've onboarded about two or three so far this week which isn't too bad it's um from the people who submitted the survey from that facebook group that i posted in and um, i have details about them like where they how they struggle and what they want to their current level and that sort of thing and their aiming points so that's really useful but I'm, make, I'm working my way down them, um, sending them emails for a Zoom call, then having a 15-minute Zoom call and then onboarding them. So that's been good so far. Um, and next week I will um, focus on testing the business model and trying to convert a couple of people. So, yeah, my next next week focus, because there's a lot of free trials ending, is having that final conversation with them to say, look, what do you find invaluable? What do you, what do you think should be improved? Would you like to go ahead and buy? <laughs> that sort of thing or which what sort of um way of paying would you prefer so i need to ask them that and be basically all front with it so but yeah that's it for this week and uh yes uh and yeah until next week